Welcome back everyone to another video where I break down scenes from the hit series The Mentalist and tell you which ones are real, which ones are completely made up, and even if you've never watched the show, don't worry about it because in this video we're going to learn a lot about lie detection, how to quickly read people, and a really awesome psychological technique that'll make people trust you more often. Here we go! I ran because I'm dead if anyone sees me talking to cops. Saints are all paranoid about informants now, which is why I'm not saying a word. Tell us about your affair with Gordon Hodge. <laughs> I wasn't sleeping with Gordon. Oh. Uh, yes, you were. It's only a few months, we're just having fun. We are starting with a big important scene all about lie detection. I talk a lot about lie detection on the channel. I've got a lot of videos where I teach you ways to know when people are trying to lie to you. But this is scripted television. Usually the tells that we see are from the subconscious mind because someone doesn't want to get caught so they do certain things with their body language to try to hide the lie. This is an actress who got a script. In her mind, she's not really scared about being caught. So we wouldn't see any of those body language signs unless the director specifically told her to act a certain way. But she does say something that's interesting. She says, I wasn't sleeping with Gordon. She changes the word that he used. He said, tell us about your affair. She said, I wasn't sleeping with. This is called psychological distancing. Often when people are lying about something, they use a word that's less severe or negative. An affair is such a dark, evil, bad thing to do that it's not something we want to say about ourselves. I'm having an affair. So we'll say something like, I'm seeing, or I'm dating, or I'm sleeping with. Something that doesn't have that negative hold. Now, is psychological distancing alone enough for me to know that someone's lying? Absolutely not. In all of my lie detection videos, I always say we need to observe multiple signs at the same time. So. If that was a real scenario, Patrick could not have known that she was lying for sure. But he gets up and he looks at her and he goes, I don't know, you, you, were, you were sleeping with him, that's a lie, very confidently. So let me ask you, why is he that confident? Let me know in the comments. I love asking you these questions. I love to hear your answers. How could he be so confident or is he that confident or is this some sort of tactic? I'll give you guys a clue. It's got something to do with confirmation bias. All right, fine. I'll give you another clue. Patrick Jane, the mentalist, knows very well what I just said. You cannot know that someone is lying with that little information. So what was he getting at? Why was he that confident? The answer to the question is coming up later in the video. It's going to be subtle, but it's going to be there. In this next clip, I'm going to show you a psychology technique that you can use in your day-to-day -day life to make people trust you more. But before we get to that, do me a huge favor, guys. Hit that subscribe button, turn those notifications on for more mentalism and psychology. Uh, long story, uh, I have to buy Walter a new car. Could you show us what you have? As I explained to Mr. Jane, we need a bank statement to confirm. Mr. Jane has assured me on his honor that he's good for it. So, I'll vouch for him. Do you need to see my bank statement? <laughs> of course not. <laughs> All right, well then let's do this. Absolutely. I think we'll have Elias show us around. But you want the best to help show you around. Yes, he's second best. He'll try harder. Right? Right. In this scene, Patrick Jane is walking into a car dealership uh, with his buddy Walter and he's convinced that there is something hidden in one of the cars that's going to incriminate one of the salesmen. So he walks in, he's got the two salesmen that he suspects, and he asks to see the showroom. Now we see the first guy uh, respond and he's resistant. He says, oh, we don't got to see a bank statement and there's a bit of nervousness there. Whereas the other guy is a lot more cooperative, big smile. So Patrick Jane is convinced that this guy is hiding something, but that's not the important thing. The important thing is the line he says at the end, which I love. He goes, well, he's second best, so he has to try harder. This is a direct reference to Avis, the car rental company. So in the early 60s, Avis was always second best to Hertz. They had always been the second best car rental company. And they came up with an ad in the 60s that said, we're number two, so we have to try harder. And their sales multiplied. For the first time in a decade, they went from losing money 
to making millions. And this caused a lot of psychologists and marketing firms to look into that and why that is. And they found out after a lot of research that self-deprecation and honesty makes people trust us more. Psychologists call this pacing and leading. Basically, by saying something that is honest and truthful, we establish ourselves as trustworthy. So in advertising or in day-to-day -day life, here's how it works. If you're trying to sell something to someone and there's a part of that thing that's not great or a negative, but it doesn't relate to what they're looking for, what's important for them, by highlighting that, you come off as more honest. So some great examples are, for example, um, Buckley's, the cough uh, syrup. Their slogan was, it tastes awful and it works. Because when we're sick, we don't care how the medicine tastes, we want it to work. So they establish that honesty, then they give you that. Or Hinge, the dating app. Their slogan is, the dating app that's designed to be deleted. So they're saying you're going to delete this app, but only because you're gonna find your soulmate first. So there's some really great pacing and leading there as well. Now, how do you use this in your day-to-day -day life? Let's say you are a salesman and you sell shoes and there's a client in front of you who's looking for a comfortable pair of shoes. That's the important thing to them. And you've got a pair of shoes that you wanna sell them. You could simply say something like, well, listen, it's not the newest model we have, but it's by far the most comfortable. And that's a great example because you know they're not looking for the newest, they're looking for the most comfortable. So by mentioning something that it doesn't have going for it, you come off as more honest and then you could sell the idea you do want. Now before we go on to my crash course on speed reading people, a quick update from the last video. So in the last video I showed you guys a clip of a young man in a insane asylum answering some questions and having a conversation and I asked you to tell me what needs you identify in this individual? What do you guys think his needs are in life? So a lot of you had some insanely good answers, a lot of insightful stuff in the comments. I always love it when you guys give great answers like that, but I identified four major needs that this guy had. The first one was a need for freedom and relaxation. So we saw a poster of a beach, we heard some beach sounds on the a uh, little sound machine he had. He asked one of the agents for a massage, so he's obviously needing to just have his freedom and decompress. The second thing was a need for intelligence. He favored intelligence over emotion. Like when he found out how one of the victims was killed, he talked about how smart that was to do it that way without showing any sympathy or empathy. This killer wore a clown costume. Any ideas who that might have been? Nuh-uh, but the clown thing's clever. No, I hated them. So he loves feeling intelligent and he respects intelligence. The third one is a need for significance. We found out in that same conversation that he wanted to do some work for free just to prove that he can do it. So he has this need to be significant in his own area of expertise. He doesn't really care what people think of him, but he just wants to make a mark and I think it's more to prove his supremacy. A lot of you said he wants to feel superior, he has ego issues, I absolutely agree. And the fourth need that I identified in that character was his need for consistency. I think that he's on the autism spectrum and because of that, he has a need for things to be consistent. For example, he's eating out of a can of pasta and we see an empty one on his desk that he uses as a uh, like a pencil holder. So he, this is part of his routine. And also when, when his sound machine was played, he panicked and he was like, no, 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 don't touch that because he has a consistent way of listening to it. And when patterns are broken, he panics. So ultimately this is the information that uh, they used on the show to find where he went after he escaped. But it was a great scene to help us identify people's social needs. And you guys did so well. And now for a crash course in speed reading people. So this is one of my favorite scenes from the entire series where he walks into a mall and there's a victim who's dead on the floor and then this happens. Leather pants, musky cologne, phallic jewelry, a ladies man went after high-end cougars with moderate success. Casual cocaine user plays guitar, not well, works in the non-creative end of a creative business. Advertising maybe, nothing worth killing anyone over anyway. So he died for romantic reasons. Where are those suspects you mentioned? The witnesses? Whatever. Hello, we're from the CBI. 
may well be that one of you is the murderer. If that's so, I'm gonna find out who. These two are innocent. They can go. Uh, stick around. We're gonna need a statement. Neil. What's the worst mistake you've ever made? Quick. Uh, first marriage. Good answer. Why so nervous? I'm not. I just, I... You. Your name? Candace. Candace. I like that name. Here. Thank you. Hey. It's okay, I'm a consultant. Candace, take my advice. Forgive your mother. Maybe the headaches will stop. I love my mother. Oh, I'm wrong. Ignore my advice. You, your name. Reed. Excuse me. This is a joke, right? A joke? A man has been killed here. Is that funny to you? Are you amused? No. Then sit. But... Reed, quick question. Green Lantern versus Thor. Who wins? Thor. Why'd you kill Rasmussen? I didn't. What a fantastic scene. And I know you guys are watching this and going, okay, well, that's obviously a ton of fiction. And you're right. It's really embellished and made to look better to make good TV. But there are small little bits of truth in there that I think are wonderful. So let's dig right in. First of all, I've said this on the channel before. What we just saw has nothing to do with mentalism. Mentalists are very good at faking that they're good at deductive reasoning and observing body language. They are not. Mentalists use tricks. What we just saw is from behavior analysis, which obviously Patrick Jane, the character, has studied. Now, some mentalists have interest in that, so they learn it, but mentalism as an art is all trickery and it's never observing things and deductive reasoning, or almost never, extremely rarely. Another thing that I've said in these videos before and is really important is nobody on this planet is that good at deductive reasoning. To look at something so small and guess something really specific with that amount of confidence. And very few commenters on my videos were like, oh, come on, it's so obvious. Obviously this means that and that means this. Yeah, it's easy to backwards justify something that's written in fiction. It's another thing entirely to be able to look at a small clue and make a specific guess. We don't really do that very often. We have a broad range of guesses, we narrow things down, but that amount of specifics is very, very rare. That being said, this was actually one of his more believable reads right there in the beginning because right away, based on what the guy's wearing, the cologne, the leather pants, the jewelry, which we call peacocking, he immediately knows that this guy is a ladies' man. He also immediately understands that this was a crime of passion. Nobody plans to kill someone in the middle of a public mall. He also knows that the weapon is hidden somewhere in the store. Therefore, the person who did this probably knows the store pretty well. He also deduces that the guy plays the guitar. We can often tell that by calluses on the fingers. He also says that he's not very good. Maybe the calluses are too widespread. So obviously he doesn't have that amount of control yet. Maybe, but again, that's what I'm saying. We would never look at something like that and jump to such a conclusive uh, sort of opinion. He also says that the guy works uh, in the non-creative part of a creative industry. And I love that he goes advertising, maybe. So now he's showing what it would really be like. I think this is what it is. Anyways, now we move on to the suspects and I love what happens here. So first off, he comes in with what we call a mind virus. A mind virus is something we say to get people to go into deep thought and if they're guilty, we see that guilt. So he goes, we're with the CBI and if anybody here is uh, guilty, we're going to find who it was. And he immediately notices that two of the employees don't budge, don't stress at all. They just stay focused. They, they wanna get out of here. They wanna know what's going on. So he immediately dismisses them. Would it be that quick in real life? Not really. You would still interrogate a little just to dig a little deeper, but you know what? It's great TV. Next, he goes up to the other employee and we see something very different. Here we do see a bit of a more stressed demeanor. His hands are hidden in his pockets. Usually whenever you can't see someone's thumbs, it's a pretty good sign that they're experiencing stress or discomfort. So his hands are hidden. He asks him, what was your biggest mistake? He says his marriage to his first wife. So here we see a guy who's got maybe issues with women, lack of confidence, which contrasts very much 
with the victim. And I think he's starting to put this together at this point and that's his first clue. Then he goes up to the Asian woman and I love everything he does in this scenario. First off, he wants her purse. So he takes a plastic mango, hands it to her and takes the purse. So this is something he's done before many times. I've covered it in my breakdown videos. It's called the Russian scam and it's based on the psychological principle of reciprocity. When we are given something, it's a human basic need to give something in return. And sometimes when you catch someone and get their brain in autopilot, you can physically give them something and as a reflex, they'll give you something back. And I have footage of me using this in the real world to take someone's wallet and it's in one of my previous videos. I will leave a link in the description, but here he does it again. Then as he's going through her stuff, he says, uh, take my advice, forgive your mother, maybe the headaches will stop. He just throws that out there. I don't think he's seeing any evidence to suggest she doesn't have a close relationship with her mom, but he just throws it out there to test her because now she gets confrontational. She goes, I love my mom. And the reason he's doing this is because if she was trying to cooperate because she's guilty, she wouldn't object like that. Usually people who are guilty of something want to cooperate. They're overly polite. They won't come in and like object to something you say. Either they just won't say anything or they'll be very cooperative. So he just threw that in. She said, I love my mom. And he goes, oh, well then ignore my advice. Listen to that again, because it's very important. Sometimes we say something that we're really not sure of with a lot of confidence to test someone else's confidence and get the truth out of them. Next up, it's the most believable one where he goes up to the guy sitting on the couch. He asks a question about heroism to baseline the guy to see how comfortable he feels. Uh, the guy answers Thor. Then he immediately asks, why did you kill the guy? And the guy just directly says, I didn't. Pretty confident uh, and his body language doesn't change. But most importantly, you got to look at the guy's body language from the get go. He's sitting on the couch very comfortably, arms wide open, which is usually a big sign of like, I'm very comfortable here. But also when we're scared or when we're lying or when we're stressed, we go into fight or flight mode, which means our brain wants an exit strategy. It's very unlikely that you're going to sit on a couch like that, a low couch, sprawl out because you can neither fight or flight or like run away in a position like that. So this guy's not stressed at all. He's chilling out. His answer is direct. That is the one that if this was a real world scenario, I would rule out almost immediately as well, which leaves us with the confrontational woman who also clutched onto her purse when he took the purse from the other woman. So this woman is a little protective, a little stressed, but also really confrontational. So I think at the end of all this in his head, he thinks it's either her or the other employee, Neil, and he kind of works with both and figures out that it was in fact Neil. So there it was guys. We learned about lie detection. We learned about reading people. We learned about persuasion and convincing people that you're being truthful. There's a question in there that I'm waiting for your answers in the comments. I really hope you guys enjoyed this breakdown. A lot of really great stuff on this one. Let me know what you thought and I will see you on the next one.